Right, well, I think we'll start. And um, first of all, I would just like to welcome everybody and also um, our Zoom uh, audience as well. And I'm just wondering if that's all right. Do we need to, everything's okay? Yep. And I hope that they can uh, hear me all right. So um, our audience is growing, so I'm very pleased to, our live audience is growing, so I'm very pleased about that. So it shows that we're slowly on the train back to a little bit of normality. And tonight it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce Professor Dionysius Adjus, uh, who um, was Professor of Arabic Studies and Islamic uh, Material Culture at the University of Exeter. He specializes um, in the maritime landscapes of the Islamicate world. And hence, we are here tonight uh, to celebrate the publication of his book, The Life uh, of the Red Sea Dao, A Cultural History of Seaborne Exploration in the Islamic World. And this was scheduled actually many months ago, and then COVID intervened, so we had to postpone it. So I really am really pleased that we, that you are here tonight, and we have a, an audience, and we have our Zoom audience as well. So thank you very much. Thank I'm you. going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Alison. I thought that was a very good introduction. And finally, we made it, you know, yes. after all this uh, wait from my 2019, if I recall well. Um, No. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, is it this one? No, it's not. Just the... Oh dear, hold on. I've got a problem. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. we just click uh, that one, one yeah. the left hand. It should maybe go, yeah. oh, it's going oh, now, it's working, it's, it's working now. Yeah. Sorry. Right, sorry course. about that. The life of the Red Sea Dao is a testament to the peoples, to the peoples of the Red Sea, their interaction with the landscapes and their work by and at the sea. As I explored this life, <clears throat> I had expected to be documenting the past, <clears throat> a forgotten past. But to my surprise, I found that the Tao has survived in many places, despite the encroachment of the modern world. The book encapsulates the cultural memories of the peoples in all their diversity over the past 100 years. At its core is an examination of the physical and cultural landscape of this world of the Tao, both past and present, as perceived by the communities themselves. The peoples of the African and Arabian Red Sea may appear at first glance to be disparate. However, they share identities deeply embedded in the past, yet still alive today in their relationship to the seascape and in their narratives and practices. The book contains 18 chapters. The first two intro introduces the book's objectives and methodology, 
data collecting, and oral history. Chapter three is the geographic context of the African and Arabian Red Sea. Chapters four to eight is about typology, documenting and remembering old DAOs, about on building DAO, the, the DAO, and skills, techniques, experiences. Chapters 9 to 13, the DAO landscape, the DAO at sea, live on board the DAO, the winds and sails. Chapters 14 to 15, DAO functions, several functions as trading, pearl diving, shell collection, fishing, slaving, and gun running. <clears throat> Chapter 17 are reflections on the Tao and its people, interacting with nature and the supernatural. And the final chapter concludes with the, with the cultural identities of a Red Sea landscape. Places visited uh, on the African coast are Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia on the Arabian shore. Um, the 166 people were interviewed of varying ages and occupations, and this, these interviews were conducted between 20, 2002 and 2013. For three of these 11 years, I led the maritime ethnography of the Red Sea with a team called Maris, um, a project based at Exeter, um, and with me there was John P. Cooper, who is in Exeter today, Chiara Zazzaro, Napoli, Italy, Lucy Saman in Beirut, Lebanon, and Julian Janssen van Ransburg in Berlin, Germany. And they all made substantial contributions to the data collected. All these years of fieldwork, I kept a diary and made audio recordings, sometimes video. This formed the backbone of the book. So now, I come to the essential question. What is exactly a DAO? Europeans, particularly those of the Dutch East India Company, engaged as they were with the mocha coffee trade during the 17th and 18th century, and entering the global trade um, of the East India Company, the British East India Company, have coined the term Dao in several of the factory records. And this became a blanket term for all types of traditional wooden sailing vessels of the Western Indian Ocean from the Red Sea, East Africa, the Arabian Gulf, Oman, to West Indian coast. As this porcelain chart shows of the 1835, and the drawing below of Dows at Suez by F. George in 1875, um, which uh, uh, um, shows the traffic of Dows even after the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. In fact, Dows 
um, uh, local communities coin different names for DAOs according to their hull design and function. They are, however, to the outsider, evocative images, bringing memories or feelings to mind of a Tao landscape. But all the locals, the indigenous, essentially, they, were, they, they, they are differentiated by whether they are square stand, as you see in the first photo on the left, and winged Uri at Hoja, Yemen. You see the transom stern, and double ended is the stem and the stern the same of this Hijazi Jordi on your right. So that's, that is the categorization of those to the Arab world. Apart from ethno ethnographic fieldwork, European travel books, European travel texts were essential, were essentially important to back information from oral sources. Europeans, um, um, European accounts on the Red Sea are invaluable, such as those of John Ovington on your left, who was a champion of the East India Company, and Karsten Niebuhr in the middle, a German cartographer and explorer who joined a Danish team in 1760 to study the human and physical geography of the Suez, Jeddah, and Mocha, and Johann Ludwig Burkhardt, a Swiss geographer and traveler, who documented the Red Sea on various aspects of the social and economic life. We have also Dominic Badia e Lablic, a Catalan, who recorded in detail his voyage in the Red Sea. And Sir Richard Burton um, himself, um, a geographer and ethnologist, who um, voyaged from Suez to Jeddah. In the 20th century, we have Henri de Montfray, um, uh, who has, we have travel accounts written by him, and the author of many books, and one mostly striking is The Secrets of the Red Sea. Alan Villiers, the Australian adventurer, um, author of several books, he's quite, quite famous for his book, Sons of Sinbad, which recounts his personal experience in sailing with local crew mariners. Both de Montfray and Villiers were experienced sailors who explored the southern region of the Red Sea, and their personal experience, their personal testimonies reveal that the indigenous people of the Red Sea, like I have experienced, live in harmony with nature and the sea. And finally, Antonin Bess. Antonin Bess family, uh, who, who, who um, um, established the Dawyard in Aden, in Yemen, employing several Yemeni uh, builders, mainly Hadramaut, very unique um, for a European to do this in terms of building a dowyard, setting up a dowyard, and but he had to close the uh, site in 1960s at the height of the political um, unrest before the British withdrawal from Aden and from the colony in 
Victorian representation of Taos. Victorian um, representation of Taos uh, is sparse, but it provides useful information when written and oral evidence is absent. So, for example, we have drawings um, of the midshipman John Edward Connor in 1795. We have um, uh, a painting by Robert Moresby in the 1830s uh, of the East India Company. He was a hydrographer, a maritime surveyor, a draftsman. Here he's depicting the port of Yambu, al Bahar, which is on the Hijaz uh, north of Jeddah. Um, then we have Samuel Austin. Uh, again, um, Samuel Austin uh, drawing here a cargo down at the port of Duba, the north of the Hijaz um, in the 19th century. Dominic. Uh, Ilablich, um, uh, interesting man because he also pro pro provides detailed measurements of this Dow. He, he sailed in, on the Red Sea from Suez to Jeddah. But more precise or more precise um, drawings and measurements come from the Vice Admiral. Um, Francois Edouard Edmond Parry. Um, his drawings are valuable in terms of understanding um, the construction of Daoists. And here he produces a sambuk, a type, also a generic type, but a specific type. And um, we get an idea of the hull shape. And compared today to today's sambuk, it's a very good and precise design. But then more precise were the photographs. So we have de Montfray, only de Montfray's photography, and Alan Villiers, who was the extraordinary um, 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 extraordinary photographer, apart from the fact that he was a great sailor. But they are these are perfect for us, particularly for watercraft and archaeologists and watercraft and scholars and to the understanding of the modern red so, Much as I was interested in the impressions of Europeans on sea craft, I was, I was um, more concerned to explore the cultural relationship between the communities themselves and their perception of the Daos at the center of their lives. We have to bear in mind that the Red Sea is a dangerous sea, one of the most dangerous in the world, so we are told by several Westerners who sailed the sea and the indigenous. It was greatly feared by those who sailed it. Why? Because of the unpredictable winds, all kinds of winds. I have got a whole chapter on these winds. But I thought they were necessary in order to understand the unpredictability of these winds and the strong currents. And not only that, you have got the problems of coral reefs and submerged rocks. Our one interviewee, interviewee Abu Bakr Habib from Tajura, Djibouti, um, explained, we raised a small sail when the wind was strong, but often 
We had to return to port after sailing for some distance. I told him, why? Because we were afraid the wind might break the yard. This breaking of the yard is something you hear very often. And sailors, sea captain, made sure that he carries a uh, extra um, one on board. And also sails getting entangled um, in, in, in the mast yard was not uncommon. But skippers took risks. Sheikh Abdullah Hamid Bukhari, a merchant of Jeddah, reported, we raised our white sails, racing on the waves, the wind blowing with force, no navigational equipment to guide us, no radio to contact anyone on land. There was nothing, there was nothing but the omnipotence of Allah and the eyes of the skipper that remained awake. In view of the hazards involved in sailing the Red Sea, I was curious as to how sturdy and seaworthy these dows were, and was fortunate enough to be able to observe dow building on sites of Egypt and Sudan over many, many weeks. What it showed me was that building a traditional DAO demands an accurate eye, a wealth of experience, and access to the knowledge of previous generations of past. DAOs performed several functions, but the main ones were trading, pearling, and fishing. They also served for pilgrim transport, not to mention slave traffic and running. The merchants um, uh, traded their goods with East Africa, um, the Horn of Africa, the Arabian Persian Gulf of today, and the sea trade today is diminished and conducted mainly in a very small area um, of uh, seaports, uh, harbors in the African and Arabian Sea, which perhaps with a little bit um, in the Horn of Africa, Malia. Pearling dows are a relic of the past, no longer to be seen, though some amateur divers continue the tradition in a small way, as this slide shows in the Farasan Island, which is opposite the Saudi Arabian coast of Jizan. And together with the Maris team, we went out there to participate with the divers, my colleagues even diving um, with the divers collecting oyster shells and then on board the Dow opening the, the shells and actually experience what it meant to have them taken to the pearl merchant, weigh them and then market it to Bahrain, India and Europe. Sea captains and camel um, drivers spoke to me um, about the pilgrim ships of the past that sailed from uh, Egypt, Egyptian Husayr and Mersa Alam to Saudi Arabian shore Al Wajh and Yambu Al Bahar, quite opposite uh, each other. The captains mentioned um, the journey could take about a day, a day and a half. 
And naively, I thought that going back would take another day, day and a half. Oh, no, they said, no, the journey, the return journey was longer. How long? Sometimes it took 10 days, even three, two, two, two weeks, if not three weeks. Why, I said, because of the, of the northwesterly wind. So they had to sail up north to Ras Muhammad on the Suez, um, um, uh, Suez Pond, you know, the Suez Canal. And down, from there, they catch the wind down to Egypt. And that would have taken a long time. Passengers on board the Dao recited prayers. And um, these um, they, 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 they performed ritual um, ceremonies. One of the prayers still recited today is this litany of the sea, Hizb al Bahar, um, which was initiated by Sheikh uh, Abu Hassan Ashadli. Uh, Maghrebi, Morocco, who came to Egypt, settled in Egypt, and um, set up a circle of, of prayers, uh, which was recited by the sailors, the crew, and the pilgrims. And they were uh, petitionary invocations to God, like this one, and to, for a safe journey. Guide us, O oh Allah and deliver us from the hands of the evildoers, and grant us a fair wind. How important that is for these sailors to get free wind, a fair wind, safe safely. During my field work, I was interested and intrigued about the people's interaction with nature, the spirit world, and the supernatural, and to explain how the Tao and its culture sit at the heart of these relationships. For example, Tao's are decorated with all different colors and different designs. And they dominate the coastal landscape. I have shown that the colors are symbolic, blue and white, and are considered especially talismanic. The decorated doves serve as a protection against the sea genies or the evil eyes, which can cause destruction to the doves. Dao, uh, sorry, um, doves uh, were used for human cargo and arms dealing. Both were codependent, with the owners and traders sometimes turning to piracy, exchanging human cargo for guns. Speaking to Rukaya Hassan Mahalla, 83 years old, widow of a former sea captain at Obok, Djibouti, sitting here in, in the middle of this uh, male group. She was unusually forthcoming on her husband's involvement in slave trafficking. She told me, except for one incident, Abdallah, her husband, was never caught. He placed the slaves in the hold of the vessel together with goats. When the British patrol intercepted his tambour, uh, the, the Dao, they would open the hatch that led to the lower deck and could only see the goats, not the slaves. She laughed. Their skin was too dark, the pitch dark and the pitch black of the night. The extensive fieldwork undertaken in this book has shown that written 
pictographic and oral data, when combined, lead us to a more comprehensive understanding of this tangible and intangible culture of the Red Sea. Written data explains why the harbor towns were booming with Indian and South Asian trade after the opening of the sea of the Suez Canal in 1869. Inevitably, when the introduction of the steamer and the later discovery of diesel oil, um, the African and Arabian Red Sea Dow activity declined. The sailing dows were dictated by the seasonal um, patterns of the winds and would need a cycle of almost 12 months, six months, months on each side of the winds with the arrival of the pilgrim trade ships. The steamer had no such restrictions, and yet the wooden dow did not fully disappear. It continues to be part of the maritime landscape and seascape, central to the lives of the communities as it always was through many many centuries. Fishing dows are all that survive today, still in many places, employing the traditional technology of building them, and often continuing to hoist sails for reasons of economy on fuel. Well, um, one important um, uh, thing to come out of the interviews was the concept of an open sea. The Red Sea had no borders um, 60, 70, 80 years ago. This meant that Egyptian, Sudanese, Eritrean, Djibouti, Yemeni, and Saudi fishermen needed no permits to go from one coast to another. No specific areas were delineated for pearl diving, for example. There was a mutual oral and um, or sometimes uh, unspoken agreement between the sea captains of Farasan and the Hlak Islands, which were opposite Eritrea of the Arabia. Also, merchants and sea captains moved from one coast to another with no border restrictions. But as each country, as each country became independent, it sought to define its borders. And that concept of an open sea was gone but it has not destroyed the unity which formerly characterized the diverse communities of, of the Red Sea, sharing as they did for so many centuries the traditional technologies of building and sailing dows, as well as the free movement of coastal migrants from either shore. Talking to the local people about their maritime heritage, I discovered that there was still a strong sociocultural link with the past. As a secondary school teacher, uh, Mohammed Al Mahdi of Farasan Island explained to me about the sea biscuit. I said, Yes, this sea biscuit. Eaten was eaten on board ship called Kurmach, uh, sorry, Kurmush. That same biscuit is now eaten on um, special occasions in my memory of those ancestors that crossed the sea um, for 
uh, or trade or uh, pilgrimage, or who went away for pearling voyages and ate that same type of biscuit. The biscuit was also in memory of the wives and brides to be who cooked and <laughs> made the biscuit. And so pearling may be almost gone, but that biscuit is a tangible reminder to the village people who worked and sailed on these doves. Other tangible uh, reminders of the past and the, the, are the decayed buildings where Egyptian and Yambui merchants once resided, standing now as a remembrance of the formal day way of, um, of life, formal way attached to the Dao and the sea. Timber um, uh, is another ting tangible heritage uh, because few houses have ship timbers reu reused as part of the door lentil, like this house in Moka, uh, Yemen. Ship planks um, serve as uh, house ceiling. And interestingly, uh, this rudder on the left um, uh, is reused as a bench at a cafe uh, entrance in uh, Obok, Djibouti. But more prominent buildings found in these shorelines are the forts, like this one, uh, the Ottoman fort restored at Al Wajah on the Hijazi coast. They were built to protect the inhabitants of the sea towns, the merchants and pilgrims against the pirate dows and the marauding uh, nomads from the desert. Also, ports like this uh, sketch shows us in Sawakin, uh, Sudan, by um, Greenlo, here Greenlo, and they were built to protect, as uh, they pointed out with the red arrow, um, they were built to protect wells, and that's the provision of water for the inhabitants passing down, particularly pilgrims. People memories can be triggered uh, by an object or something that to them is symbolic. Memory landscape is a cultural image, a mirror of memories encoded with meanings that are significant for the cultural identity of the people and in the environment that they live in. The, if you look at this slide, it shows us the maritime life on a pictorial wall with a sailing dhow at a restaurant in Masawa, Eritrea, or this poster in Abok, Djibouti, um, on the wall of the mayor's office. But other signs to preserve identity express a feeling or image with objects portraying the maritime past, like this, the Dao and oyster shell, a jizan of this in, in Saudi Arabia, often manifestations of a link with the maritime heritage, or in Crater Square in Aden, a model of the Dao Sambuk on a column, and in the middle of the roundabout, engravings, engravings of old uh, past um, Taos, the base. At Umlech, uh, in, on the Hijaz coast, um, uh, the monument captures a sailing boat enclosed in a circle with a fish plunging across the mast and the sail. Museums attempt to catch collective memories of the individual and the community 
who are now sharing their ancestral rituals and symbolic practices with today's maritime culture. One is on Farasan Island, west of the Saudi Arabian coast, uh, in a boys' um, primary school, which is curated by the headmaster. Or um, uh, Mohammed Noor, the head of the Ortega tribe in Sawakin. He stores objects in his house and private collections, uh, um, paintings of locals um, about the former island um, or island town that um, um, he lived all his life. And the occasional uh, representations of the folk museums, such as that of Abdul Rauf Khalil Museum in Jeddah, which contains paintings of local artists evoking past practices in fishing. These artifacts kept in private houses um, or public uh, places are indeed cultural messages that are addressed to posterity. The local people in the case of Farasan Island, Walken, are keen to preserve the cultural memories of the past that will continue to grow as that lifestyle recedes further away from the modern world. Objects sit in museums to remind us of the past. But do they capture the life of the Tao? Do they capture the life of the people and the Tao? Do they capture their feelings and emotions? I spoke to this man, pearl diver, 75 year old um, in Farasan, Munawar Akili. I asked him, what did he remember of the maritime past? It was complete silent. Very embarrassing. I didn't know what. To do, but he struggled. He struggled to remember and articulate his experience. But then he went under the bed to fetch something. Curious to see what he's coming up with. And he brought from under the bed, under the bed, a, a, a handkerchief. Um, he opened the handkerchief and there was this lovely pair wrapped in this handkerchief for many years. When he saw this pearl, triggered a torrent of memories from his pearling days. This pearl, if it were to be displayed in the museum, would be meaningless. But by recording his voice and his emotions, he expressed, we bring history to life. And it is encounters like this that it made my study really a joy um, and a privilege to undertake. <clears throat> the life of the coastal people you know, um, it was once dominated by the sea and of course the Tao, is slowly becoming disconnected with its natural environment. With the significant exception of some remaining fishing and trading communities. But unlike the Arabian Gulf and Oman, and this I have recorded very well and published uh, in the past books about the Tao's Huh? The Red Sea is different. The Red Sea natural environment has not been spoiled by the commercial excesses of the petroleum culture. Oil has not colonized the environment 
as it did in the eastern coast of Arabia. Nonetheless, nonetheless, it is a fact that the, land, that the seascape has started to be affected by the tourist industry. And the sea is increasingly becoming a dumping ground for the pollution caused by it. The beautiful seaside resorts created for the public are now full of luxurious holiday homes as people choose to holiday by the sea. And yet, and yet, uh, many communities have remained on the coast, such as, such as this beautiful sea town of Tajura, Djibouti, with the mountains at the background of Ethiopia. This contrasts with the large numbers of residents on the shores of the Gulf states who moved away from the sea some 50 years ago to embrace an urbanized life. And ironically, as the past becomes remote, it becomes more precious. And these Gulf residents want now to know more about their heritage, to creating museums. So the more they are divorced from the natural coastal landscape, the more some want to be reconnected with it. On the Red Sea, however, many people still live the traditional way, traditional way of life. In many ways, the Dao is still central to their life, so much so that some were perplexed, were perplexed as to why, why on earth we come thousands of miles to record the heritage. But The past is with us. The past is present in the living heritage that we live in. The preference for the fiberglass boats, such as this Umlaj port in Saudi Arabia, and just because it is economically overwhelmingly superior although a serious blow, let's face it, has not succeeded in killing the Red Sea Dao off entirely. Reasons for this must be economic. Many of the Red Sea countries on the African and the Arabian shore, except for Saudi Arabia, are impoverished. So it makes sense to repair the old Dao's why no electricity is needed when using traditional dows to build wooden dow. There's also the ready availability of local wood in these countries. Thus, there is a still thriving, um, if diminished, traditional dow culture in the Red Sea most noticeably in Egypt, most noticeably in Yemen, and as this image shows, Sawakin in Sudan, sorry, Sawakin in Sudan, in Eritrea. And the story, and the story of the wooden Red Sea Dao is one of surviving, such as this shell collecting lunch from book in Sudan, Nawaki and the fishing uh, boat at Khor al Khoreira in Yemen. Trad traditional Dao building is still active in Sudan and mechanical, man 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 no electricity, manual. Egypt, still going on, and parts uh, of Saudi, and they are built for difficult, uh, different purposes, and where one can still see the occasional Dao sailing to economize um, uh, fuel and of course use 
news that back up uh, emergency. Um, apart from the fact that some still use our navigation. So what's happening is that prepared wooden dows are seen everywhere. Egypt in particular, in Sudan, Eritrea, Yemen. They are still in many ways part of that Red Sea heritage. But for how long? How much longer? There is certainly diminished interest either from the people of the state or the state itself in the preservation of their wooden um, watercraft. Dows are abandoned, like this one in Mocha, Yemen, or left partly constructed, such as this one at Khor al Ghureira in Yemen. Several reasons why Dows are abandoned. Speaking to Sheikh Yahya Ibrahim al Najdi of Farasan, it told me it was necessary. He said, I was a sea captain, a pearl merchant. I owned a sambuk built in Duhaya, Yemen. That lasted 25 years, and that was a good time. It became damaged. And finally, beyond repair, abandoned and left the sea captainship. Because dows and other material objects in the past are gradually disappearing, and because they are increasingly no longer seen or talked about, they start to be forgotten. The lack of material in archives, such as photographs, pearl measuring equipment, logbooks, maritime manuals, harbor registers uh, of cargo dogs, are a major loss to the communities of their maritimity. The purchase of objects by private or state collectors does not necessarily demonstrate continuity, nor memory transmission. Displayed as they often are in isolation, lacking context and history. My study, my book, has managed to salvage memories by recording and documenting the voices of the people who have lived that mar their maritime life, that maritime life, sharing their knowledge, skills, and material culture. The book has clearly demonstrated the prominent role that ethnographic fieldwork can play in uncovering maritime cultural identity and the value of advocating a qualitative approach that combines empirical evidence with theoretical analysis and corroborates oral accounts with written text, written old text, the voices of the Red Sea peoples, and their narratives echo today. As I speak, it is true that what Muhammad Said al Ahmadi of Jeddah said the sea fades away as we age, but its stories, their prices, and secrets remain in our memory. And Thank you for your patience. Now, do we have any, any questions from the audience or from our um, tip? 
we've got anyone on the chat. Well, um, all right, we can look at that. <clears throat> any any questions? Well, I, I'll start off with one, okay. which I, I probably missed to keep it of, of beginning. Um, was you said the word Dao? What's the the or You said it, it came from the British. Well, because I was just you know what it. I was trying to think of it in Arabic. It's a, it's a long, long story which, oh, right. I, which I discussed in, in one of the books that okay. the Arabian Guide of Oman. But in a nutshell, the word Dao, first of all, there, is a, a, there exists a real Dao. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, you, which was used in the 19th century, 18th, 18th, 19th century, and uh, it was. We, we, most probably it was a, it was a Western Indian Ocean Dao. <laughs> okay. Dao. But so the, the, the history of it is very difficult to, to explain. Uh, but the name, the name, the, the nomenclature remained and was used by the, as I said, the East India Company, mm -hmm. the Dutch and British. Uh, especially in the 17th, 18th century. And then the British, who were policing um, the Arabian waters, especially the Horn of Africa, the Red Sea, East Africa, up to even the Arabian Persian Gulf, um, uh, started calling any piratical right. okay. powers, right. gun smuggling or okay. slaving. Down. So, in a nutshell, but the origins and the, the, the provenance, the, the, what we call it, the, 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 the word where it comes from, is, is something that I yes. have studied and to sum it up in. in so, we in have it. to go, we should yeah. look it up in yeah. more details. But, yeah. but, <laughs> the, 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 but this, the, yes. the work no, still no. Goes, no. goes on. Yeah. No, I do, it's, it's just interesting because. Um, you know, it's sort of a universal word that Absolutely. we all are familiar with, yeah. but you had other other words, some uh, et cetera, yeah, exactly. describing other yeah. types and of... It's, it's I can't even say Dao's now. <laughs> That's no, awful. it's something that in Greek. Uh, yeah, yeah. In the, in, the, in, the, in the West. All right. Well, we have some questions on the uh, chat, which everybody can see on the screen. Um, here we have, uh, what about the transport of animals? Oh. You referred yes. to goats hiding slaves yes. en passant, but what was the significance of the transport of animals? Yes, um, we have uh, several um, uh, informants, especially on the African side, in Djibouti and Eritrea. And Djibouti in particular, who um, talked to me about this question of transport. Uh, cattle, horses, mm -hmm. Um, but mainly cattle and sheep, um, uh, not, not to hide slaves, but actually um, shipping them over uh, as part of the market. Yeah. So, now, um, there is also references um, that go back to Islamic texts about transport of animals, <laughs> especially horses mm -hmm. in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. and uh, in Yemen, mm -hmm. uh, India, wow. and, and the Arabian, uh, Southern Arabian coast. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't deal with that because I'm mm -hmm. of the modern period. But it's interesting what people told me. I was intrigued about um, uh, on, uh, my colleagues and I were walking on the beach in uh, Djibouti, and we saw hulks of remaining Cows, you know, that perish mm -hmm. through a uh, farm of a shipper. And the guy out of the blue told me a story, a narrative of what happened to this cow. And he, he remembered the owner very well. He said it was tragic. The whole, the cow collapsed and he lost God knows how much. And of course, you know, mm -hmm. I can imagine it costs a lot. Uh, of to, uh, course. Uh, he said, cattle never send their study on a cow. 
So it does it never helps um, to, to to tie them or whatever, you know, because they are horses are steady, but not cattle. And he said the cause of this shipwreck, the particular one that we saw, Hulk, was caused by well, they're moving too moving, much. Yeah, yeah, too much. Yeah. Too much. It was uh, something that I didn't know about mm -hmm. and not to talked about in text. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no. um, there's another, the first question actually is here about um, an example of a new and um, luxurious euro being constructed as a leisure item for a Middle Eastern billionaire. Have you got any evidence of new and luxurious? Dows being constructed. Yes, 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 yes. There is, especially in the Gulf and Oman. Mm -hmm. uh, they are built mainly in Calicut. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I saw them. The only problem with with those luxurious dows, they call them what do they call them? Um, they call them gin. No, not gin. Something alcohol dows. Oh. Yeah, gin, gin, gin palaces. Gin, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, was, yeah, thanks. So it was there, but it, it couldn't. Uh, yeah, th these gin palaces, unfortunately, they are not true to the design. Uh, uh, especially okay. the, yeah. the, um, the boom okay. in, in Kuwait and the Bakara. Beautiful dows. Um, but the, no, there's a hodgepodge of design. Yeah. So, I ask the the carpenters, you know, mm. why do you do this? Why well, do we do what I ask us to do? The poor guys. <laughs> <laughs> I cornered them, you know, we should ask them. Right. Um, and there's another one from uh, Peter. Rob, where did the timber come from? Okay, that's a very good question because it's a one one that that uh, intrigues everybody who's studying those. Essentially. Uh, for a long, long time, even even through the, the, the Arabic text of old, and they most of the, the wood, thatch, teak came from India, West, West Indian ah, coast, okay. right. uh, what what we call Malabar coast, mm -hmm. and they came from the mountains. Then they were rolled by the elephants into the river. You know, and mm. they were put on dows, you know, six, seven of them, and shipped to the Gulf. However, some of the, some of some of the dows that we see or that sailed in the uh, Arabian Gulf and one, they were built on the West Indian coast. Oh, I see, and then cheaper. sailed over. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, and the same thing happened in in uh, Red Sea. They were um, ex ex um, importing teak. However, however, uh, a lot of many many dows, many parts of the dows were built through local wood. Mm -hmm. um, this you see, um, I've, I've discussed uh, length in seafaring in the Arabian Gulf and Oman. Uh, about this, um, and also in this book, uh, what happened in, in the Red Sea. They still use local wood. Mm -hmm. So okay. beautiful, you know, from the mountains, you know, mm -hmm. get all mm -hmm. kinds of, or parts of the, of the, of the carried on donkey car. <laughs> uh, <interesting. laughs> and uh, um, in Yemen too, um, very sturdy wood mm -hmm. parts, but they are not importing heat anymore. Right. That, those were the days. They, at some point, they were importing a teak from Indonesia, Java. Mm -hmm. In fact, so in fact, fact they call it Jawa. Jawa. Yeah. <laughs> Jawa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, such Jawa. Uh, Indonesia, what's the other one? One of the islands of the East, East Asians. But uh, the quality, not as good as the Indian one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But then they had to stop. Because the Indian government put um, restrictions on not to cut teak anymore, mm. the, 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 the price got Jota. up. Yeah. And of course, it could have led to the demise of the town to some extent. This is, mm -hmm. I mean, my conclusion, but it could be a different economic reason. 
Right. Well, we have a, another question here. You mentioned pirate DAOs. No. Did uh, merchants and fishermen have strong reasons to fear them? Uh, nowadays, yes, they do. They do. Mm. They, 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 um, um, informants spoke to me um, um, often about pirates, the, the pirate of their activity. Um, uh, basically, robbing them of um, um, their livelihood, uh, whether it was cattle or whether it was um, other objects, including slaves. But we are talking of the past. Um, modern times, of course, they are afraid of island towns, especially from Somalia, for mm. other reasons. Mm. Mm. Um, but um, uh, this, this, a lot of this sla slaving them um, were, of course, taking a lot of risk because of the pirates um, and taking them and, and giving them themselves to different owners. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah. Right, and we have a, another question from Judy Colbus in Oxford, Ohio. All right. Uh, she says, I visited Oman three years ago and went to Sur, where there was only, there was, there was a, a, a magnificent museum dedicated to the Dao. Mm -hmm. So not only that, but an active shipyard with quite a number of Dao's oh. being built. It was a magnificent site, but if you wanted one, you had to wait for several years. <laughs> Perhaps this was for pleasure rather than working vessels. Yes. The tradition seems to be quite alive, even with merchandise coming from Iran, really for the food markets. So oh, she also thanks you after that. So I think she's referring to the Oman as a... Yes, very true. As a matter of fact, I interviewed you know, those families, those family of carpenters in uh, Sur in the 90s. And she's right to say that nowadays they still uh, build them, and some of them are for leisure, but quite a few are still being built for uh, for fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, a lot are being built on the same design of fiberglass. Right. And this is the tragedy of a lot of the Gulf Dows. Mm -hmm. Less in the Red Sea, they're still wooden. Um, so exactly the same. Design, that's fine. Okay. And that's unfortunate. Right. And how much did European sailors and boat builders learn from the construction and sailing of the Dow and vice versa? Do you think uh, an exchange of knowledge in, in, the, in that yeah. the relationship yeah. between the, the two? Okay. Can you repeat it? Um, this is a question from William Crawley saying, did European sailors and boat builders uh -huh. learn from these DAOs, you know, learn about their construction and how the rigs were put up, the sails were put up? Yeah, you mean the, the, Was there an exchange of yes, information yes. one way? Yeah, one so way. you would have perhaps European influences coming into the DAO yeah, structure was, and yeah. likewise the other way? There was, there is a lot of, lot of talk about the Portuguese carpenters in the 16th century entering the, the Indian Ocean, Western, and going to the West Indian coast, South Africa, and they were contributing, influencing, the locals of how galleys are built. Mm. Hence, you have towers like Ranja, which is very similar to France, the Portuguese. No, but I, I think um, that there, there may have been some exchange, mm -hmm. um, but I, I wouldn't say that, uh, and, and of course there was a give and take in, in many respects, but um, a very difficult 
question, difficult answer to, to of course. But um, it's very easy to say yes, there was, but um, what exactly it was. <laughs> yeah. but, but modern times, there has been a lot of Dao researchers. You know, I've been doing this for 40 years now. Um, I took a very great interest in what they do and how they build their mm. Dao set. Mm. And as I mentioned, you know, this readiness, accuracy, I was in there. No designs, no, no, no uh, yeah, it's just, just, yeah, in their heads. All, all in the head. Yeah. Do we have any questions from our audience? I've just got one, one last one. And what was the longest journey you did on, on, a, on a DAO? Uh, well, uh, interestingly, I studied DAOs, but I didn't journey. All oh, right. <laughs> okay. I studied those inten inten intensively, but I did. I did. I did. Very long, though. Very, very short. Okay. Well, yes. I was, one day or two. Well, I, I, where I grew up, when I was growing up, we used to go at the weekend for fishing on the Dows. I just remember some terrible days of being very seasick because yeah. the swell. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the swells. And yeah. I also remember the songs they used to sing. Yeah. yeah, to get everyone going, you know. That's, a, that's an interesting note you yeah. mentioned because I'm, what I'm doing now, I'm studying the songs of the sea. Oh, really? Oh. But in the Red Sea. Okay. Oh, well, the interesting. I, I be Taurus has been kind uh, to invite <laughs> me to. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're going to give you a rest and a drink. Yeah, and you. I would just thank like you. everyone to join me in thanking you very, very much. But it was really very, very interesting. And, you know, I didn't realize there was such a tremendous history behind it. And I didn't even realize there were different kinds of, you know, different names. So yeah. it was really, and I hope everyone will, you know, go and buy the book. There is a special discount flyer, so please do. All right, so thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. And you've got lots of very nice comments. Thank no. you for your answers. Fascinating talk. So no, thank you. They're all here. And I think, um, Johnny, you can save them in the chat. Thank so, thank yeah, you. I think, I yeah. Think so you can see, see them. Yeah, of course. Very, very, very yeah. encouraging. Yeah. Very kind. Yeah. No, so thank you.